Good afternoon and greetings from San Diego, California. My name is Thomas Ickham. I am the President and Chief Scientific Officer of Medistem Inc. and I am honored to be part of the faculty of the Tropical School of Medicine. Today we're going to discuss regenerative medicine, specifically the area of stem cells and stem cell therapeutics. So first of all, what is a stem cell? And why do people, why do we hear so much about stem cells? A stem cell is a type of cell that can make copies of itself, but at the same time, it can become different other types of cells. So the first stem cell that scientists found were the bone marrow stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells. These are the cells in the bone marrow that make blood. They're also the first stem cell therapeutic that has actually worked and has benefited more than 100,000 people. So, in the bone marrow, the bone marrow stem cell, it has a specific type of protein signature. They have these proteins on them called CD34s, and they lack proteins called CD38. So, these specific cells, um, they can make red blood cells. So, when the body when, let's say you're climbing up in a mountain, there's not enough oxygen, you need more red blood cells, the CD34 cell gets activated by erythropoietin in the kidney, and it ends up producing more red blood cells. Let's say you have an infection. With an infection, you need more white blood cells. So, the um, different things in the bacteria, lipopolysaccharides, for example, they activate macrophages, Macrophages then produce chemicals such as GCSF, granulocyte colony stimulating factor, and that leads to the production of more white blood cells. So that's another interesting point about stem cells. They make copies of themselves, but they also differentiate into different tissues. Now, we've been hearing a lot about embryonic stem cells, and embryonic stem cells are very interesting. They're interesting because the embryonic stem cell um, can generate every tissue in the body. The hematopoietic stem cells usually make blood. They make some other tissues too when you when you uh, add different chemicals to them. But the big big thing is the um, advantage of the embryonic stem cells and why people got so excited about it is that you can make heart, liver, lung, all sorts of different tissues. The problem with embryonic stem cells is that because they are so undifferentiated, they're very difficult to control. So remember how we said in blood, in the hematopoietic stem cell, if the body needs more red blood cells, the body makes erythropoietin, that stimulates production of more red blood cells. Problem is the embryonic stem cells, they only know how to work in the embryo. That's the big problem. So when you put embryonic stem cells into an adult, what happens is you get tumors. You get tumors called teratomas is because they do not know how to integrate. So now the next question comes, okay, well, if embryonic stem cell therapy is so difficult um, to use and the bone marrow stem cells have the inherent problem that they particularly make um, red cells and white cells and different lymphocytes, types of white cells and platelets, um, then what's the point of stem cell therapy? Well, here's the point. What the point is, is that the bone marrow stem cells actually produce chemicals that can activate endogenous stem cells. So this was part of the big revolution, if you will, was the finding that every type of tissue has its own stem cells, just very small numbers of them. Uh, so for example, in the heart, in the adult heart, it was found that after a heart attack, there's actually cells from the heart that start making copies of themselves and they start trying to heal the injured heart. And these are called cardiac specific stem cells. These tissue specific stem cells, they've been found in pretty much every major tissue. They've been found in the brain, in the brain in the subventricular zone and in the dentate gyrus. There's actually stem cells that multiply and after a stroke they start trying to heal the brain. So this brings us back, you know, in the liver, the same thing has been found in the liver. Um, 
and liver obviously is one of the major regenerative organs and it has its own stem cell compartment. Um, also in the lung you have the type 2 uh, pneumocytes, AVUL pneumocytes, which they have some regeneration. The problem is though, these tissue specific stem cells, they either get exhausted or they don't get activated properly enough after, after the damage. So to go back to the bone marrow, this is where things became very interesting. Um, back in the late 1990s, people started seeing that the bone marrow cells, you would take the bone, take out all the cells without necessarily purifying for CD34, and you would inject those cells into patients that have had heart attacks. And these patients would be getting better. There's actually even phase, large phase 2 trials, even some phase 3 trials, showing injection of bone marrow into the heart is therapeutic. But, you know, we talked to a big extent, the bone marrow generally just makes hematopoietic cells, so why would there be a therapeutic effect? Well, it appears that the therapeutic effects come from the bone marrow producing chemicals called cytokines, which then activate the endogenous stem cells in the body, in the different places. So it's actually, it's not as simple as people used to believe that it was. It's not that you just inject the bone marrow and the bone marrow is a cure for everything. But the bone marrow does integrate with the cells that you have in your body. It does integrate um, in order to cause neoangiogenesis. New blood vessels uh, to allow the stem cells that already are there to heal. Um, if they produce growth factors that prevent the stem cells from dying. So after a heart attack, one of the things that happens is you have very high amounts of oxidative stress free radicals. That goes and it kills. Um, it kills the endogenous stem cells. So the bone marrow stem cells, they seem to be protective. Now, let's talk about therapeutics and really what can be done with stem cell therapy. With bone marrow, one of the big problems is you need to drill. I don't know how many of you have seen bone marrow aspiration. This is a very painful process. You use a drill and you need to use a drill into the hips of the patients that just had a heart attack or just had a stroke. And you need numerous holes to get enough bone marrow. And the problem is you can only do it once. You, do it. you can't continue to keep doing this. So that's where the whole concept, and I know people have done similar things with fat, fat stem cells, liposuction. If you take a look, I'm sure on YouTube here, um, there's a lot of videos if you YouTube liposuction. That's not, that's not as a uh, pleasant procedure either. So the big interesting thing, at least in our minds, is the advent of the universal donor stem cell. So um, remember we said in the bone marrow there's hematopoietic stem cells that make blood? In the bone marrow, there's also mesenchymal stem cells. These are cells, and they're also found in fat, by the way. These are cells who, one of their main jobs in the body, physiologically, um, is to protect the stem cells. They're a special type of stem cell that does not need to be matched with the recipient, allowing for people to produce large amounts of these cells in tissue culture and then keep them frozen and use them as a drug. So the first great work in this area of bone marrow, um, mesenchymal stem cells, was the work of Arnold Kaplan from Case Western. And, you know, actually they were, there's um, discussions that it was actually Friedenstein um, from Moscow who discovered them back in the 70s. He did publish. He didn't call them bone marrow mesenchymal cell, stem cells. He called them, I um, forgot exactly what he called them, but the, he described the same cell, but he didn't characterize it the way that um, Ernie Kaplan characterized it. And um, anyway, so Ernie Kaplan, what he did is he was able to produce them in great quantities from one donor to make a large number of these cells. He was able to have protein markers on the cells so that you know where your expanding is the cell you want to expand. And then the company Osiris used the intellectual property to um, push the area of stem cells to where it has never gone before in the sense that Osiris was the first non-hematopoietic stem cell company. Remember, hematopoietic is like bone marrow transplants. Those have been around since the days of Dr. Thomas, the uh, original bone marrow transplant. 
But um, the first non-hematopoietic stem cell therapeutic, stem cell drug therapeutic, if you will, this was Osiris, who ended up getting approval for sales, marketing approval in Canada and in New Zealand. And that by itself is very interesting. What was their approval for? It was not for generating new hearts or new livers. It was for treatment of graft versus host disease. Graft versus host disease is what happens after a bone marrow transplant when the transplanted graft, the transplanted bone marrow, starts attacking the recipient. One of the most devastating inflammatory conditions and is the biggest cause of hematopoietic transplant related mortality and morbidity. So what does this mean? This means for us students of medicine, of biology, um, and us drug developers, what it means is that just because it's a stem cell doesn't mean that the main thing you want to treat in the beginning has to be one of the classical diseases associated with degeneration. The first approval of a stem cell product outside of hematopoiesis was based on its anti-inflammatory actions. Now, with Osiris, unfortunately, with the bone marrow, the problem is when you expand the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell, when you expand it a lot, they start to lose activity. Um, so people have started looking at other cells type populations in the bone marrow. Um, you have mesoblast, which was founded by a good Romanian like myself, um, Dr. Atesco. And mesoblast is taking out a specific subset of the mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow, hoping that they're going to have even more potency than Osiris, because although Osiris got approved in Canada and New Zealand for graft versus host, um, in the U.S. they did not, and in the U.S. they did not get approved for type 1 diabetes, and um, they had to stop their Crohn's disease study. So the point is, you have the second generation, if you will, which is mesoblast. Also, maybe one and a half generations is um, atherosis. You know, atherosis using Catherine for Pfizer, um, another way of purifying stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow. Um, then, if you will, the third generation, what we like to think is the third generation, is the mesenchymal stem cells that we do at Medistem. These are mesenchymal stem cells that we have identified from the lining of the uterus, from the endometrium. Our whole philosophy was, here's a tissue that every month regenerates itself. Every month, you have new blood vessels made and an explosive growth in the endometrium. So we identified the mesenchymal stem cell component of the endometrium we called them endometrial regenerative cells. And we've seen very early on in our studies, we have seen that the um, cells are more potently angiogenic. They make new blood vessels a lot stronger and a lot quicker than bone marrow does. So we use these patients, we use these cells uh, through clinical collaborations in patients with heart failure, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, we published that, that data, and then we were fortunate to receive FDA clearance to begin clinical trials in the United States. And also we have a clinical, in the U.S., the work is being done on critical limb ischemia, which is a peripheral artery disease, advanced peripheral artery disease, primarily in patients with diabetes where they're going to lose their legs. So we're doing some of that work. Um, and also in heart failure, we have a phase two study, double blind study, where we inject our new stem cells into the coronary sinus, the area of the heart where the blood drains out of. We inject the cells and the cells go into the myocardium and produce growth factors to stimulate angiogenesis and activate um, the endogenous stem cells. So one of the things I wanted to say, obviously part of the future of medicine will be Medistem and the work that we're doing. Um, but without being narrow focused, um, I would see, say that the future of regenerative medicine lies in understanding the innate properties of these cells and where they fit in biologically. And when I say these cells, I mean stem cells in general. Uh, so particularly we're going to be seeing in the next several years 
different optimization of environments before administration of stem cell, and even different engineering of stem cells to enhance therapeutic properties. Um, thank you very much. It's been an honor to join you, um, at least by video. I hope to be attending this call myself and um, to be participating with you in developing the future of medicine. Thank you very much.